Thanks for joining us. This is the Raspberry Pi Foundation Computing Education Research Seminars. Um, I can see some familiar faces in the chat and um, and, and also on, on Zoom, um, but some of you may well be new to us. If this is the first one you've come to, then, then welcome. Um, we're going to have a really interesting talk today and a chance for discussion and a chance to meet some other people um, as well who share your interest in computing education. Um, you can uh, use the chats to ask questions and, and put things in. Uh, during the talk, um, perhaps uh, you can keep, uh, keep hold of your questions because after the talk, we're gonna have um, a breakout room to have some discussion, generate those questions and then come back together. So we'll, we'll have uh, the 40 minute presentation to begin with. Then we'll go into the breakout rooms for about 20 minutes to discuss in small groups. So there should be plenty of time for, for some nice discussion um, and meeting some people. We generally have quite a mix between practitioners, researchers, academics, uh, people who are doing their own studies and doing their own research. So we should have a good discussion for the 20 minutes and then we'll come back together for a Q&A um, as well. I'm really, really delighted to introduce Sue Sentence. Um, Dr. Sue Sentence, who's the Chief Learning Officer here at Raspberry Pi Foundation. If you've been to these talks before, we often have um, speakers from lots of different institutions. And today, Sue, uh, Sue's joining us from Raspberry Pi itself. She's presenting um, her research that she's uh, conducted both herself and, and with collaborators on PRIM. Um, and this is all about encouraging language and talk in the programming classroom. Um, and it's some research that is quoted a lot. I've often seen uh, people writing about this research and there's a series of publications coming out at the moment. Um, it's really interesting um, both in terms of uh, an approach that's been put together and um, kind of uh, invented but then has also been really thoroughly tested with teachers um, and, um, and, and with practitioners and Sue's going to share the results um, of that as well as telling us what PRIM is and how it can have an impact on, on teaching and, uh, and education. So thank you so much Sue for, for joining us. Um, if you could share your screen, perhaps if um, Tom comes off his screen and, and Sue you could share your screen and then I'll pass over to you and look forward to hearing about, um, about PRIM and about the research and the feedback that you've had for it. So it's very strange for me because I've chaired all the sessions up to now and now I'm actually delivering one. So um, I'm delighted to be here talking about PRIM and I've um, spoken about PRIM quite a lot. PRIM is a, um, a, a way of structuring programming lessons that stands for predict, run, investigate, modify and make. It's based on some research that I did in 2017, 2018, when I worked at King's College London and um, carried out with, also with Jane Waite and Maria Callier, who were at King's then. And um, some of you may have heard me talk about PRIM before. I don't know how many of you have, have, have know about it or have used it, but today particularly, as well as talking about that, I want to talk about how PRIM encourages talking, classroom dialogue and vocabulary development in programming lessons. And that's gonna be the focus of the talk today. So the structure of my talk, um, six sex sessions, sections. Um, so I'm gonna start by giving a, some background on language and dialogue, classroom tap talk in the classroom. Um, and then we'll get into programming, PRIM, what we've researched we've done on PRIM, and then how it relates to classroom talk. So that's how I'm going to structure the session. So we'll start off by setting the scene. And if you look at this picture, um, you can see a normal classroom situation. Now what's going on in this classroom. You've got a teacher and some students. Think about what, um, what might be happening and then think about it in terms of language. So all of these types of language might be happening. Explaining, instructing, the teacher might be modelling, uh, the students hopefully are listening. At some other point they might be questioning, sharing, lots of different forms of language happening in this one classroom interaction. So that's really important. And here we have another image. Here are some students. What kind of language is happening here? So we've got 
uh, possibly a student is, is, is sharing something, they're problem solving, hopefully they're reasoning about the program, whatever they're looking at. Uh, they might be asking questions and all the other things that I've got on there. So the point of that is just to show you that language in, in education covers a whole range of different types of talking, discussing, listening, etc. And there's absolutely loads of research on this um, topic. But when I've been looking into this, a lot of the research is from maths education, from science education, um, also from language learning and um, English, etc. The book at the, on the right hand side of the screen, this, it shows my age really. I started training as a maths teacher and this was the book that I had when I was trained to teach math, language and mathematical education. But there's no book on um, language in computing education. We're still teaching, we use a lot of vocabulary, but we really don't have um, a lot of research in this area. And I really think it's something that we should be investigating more. I think it relates very well to PRIM. And so I um, wanted to um, share that with you today. In terms of language and computing education, all really you've got is got a little bit about pair, pair programming. There's some, there's some research there around turn taking and dialogue in pair programming. There's a chapter in a book I edited a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks, huh, a couple of years ago um, uh, called Language and Computing written by um, Ira Dout and colleagues. And I'll talk about that a bit later on, but otherwise there isn't really a lot. So I picked out a few little pieces of research to think about um, in terms of um, language and education. So I'm focusing on dialogue and language and vocabulary. Thirsty work. So first of all, um, dialogic education is anything around talking. And I've picked out three particular areas um, in case this is something you're not really familiar with. So there's some work around, um, some very sort of classic work by a guy called Martin Neustrand and his colleagues around um, the way that teachers use dialogue in the classroom, the way that they can um, organize their, uh, their questioning, et cetera, so that they don't, so that they ask um, questions that follow up from students. So one of the things he talks about is uptake. Students and teachers incorporate students' res responses into what he said they say next. They think about genuine, authentic questions that explore students' views. And they incorporate the response into further discourse. So this kind of high level evaluation. And this work has been very much cited and has made a big um, contribution to the area of dialogic education. And then there's the work at Cambridge University. So Neil Mercer's pictured there, I think he's recently retired, but him and lots of colleagues in the Faculty of Education at Cambridge have done uh, lots of subsequent projects around dialogue in um, the classroom, um, all sort of hanging around this big project called Thinking Together. And in this project, they think about the types of dialogue that helps children develop. And they've come up with, you know, lots of, 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 of um, they've done lots of, of classroom research and three things emerge from this. Um, the one I've got at the bottom, that the teacher is really important in modeling and guiding the way that, that the students talk to each other and that students need guidance and practice in using language to reason and problem solve and to be able to use a language effectively. And that the quality of their language improves their understanding. And this has been done in the context of math um, and is based on um, sociocultural theory by Vygotsky and where we think about social interaction having a real impact on individual learning and intellectual outcomes. And that's also been a, a real influence in the work that I've done as, as PRIM, so I thought it's worth mentioning there. And there's another key bit of research around dialogue called the Cambridge Classroom Dialogue Project that's more recent. And there are three kinds of, um, uh, uh, in this particular piece of research, I'll go back to the beginning, in this piece of research, Christine Howe and Neil Mercer and colleagues looked at upper primary students 
and looked at the kinds of dialogue and whether they had actual impact on learning outcomes in what we call in England SATs tests. So these are tests taken when you're sort of um, age 10 or 11 in maths, literacy and science. And they found that where the dialogue included elaboration and querying and student participation, it had a positive impact on actual outcomes in really high stakes assessments. And elaboration, you can see the definitions there, building on each other's, um, the, the, the teacher's comment, the teacher's dialogue, the teacher building on student dialogue, querying and challenging, and then students talking to each other and building on each other's um, um, language. So really important aspects of dialogue. And the other thing I said I'd talk about is vocabulary. And of course, in, in computing, we've got loads of language and um, uh, vocabulary items we need to learn and students can find them very, um, very confusing. So again, there's lots of research been done on this in math and in science. I've picked out a couple of things here. So the recommendation is that teachers use research validated instructional methods to teach important vocabulary in maths. We don't really know what those um, research um, methods are in computing. We haven't really done that research. So that's something that we need to do. But we can draw on maths and, and science education when we're doing this. And in the, the bottom item I've got on there, the, the, um, the chapter in, in the book, in my book that I talked about earlier, talks about using meta discourse to try and unpick the difference between computing terms that we use in every day and their scientific use and that we kind of talk to students about language. And the middle point there that we need to support learners when they're using vocabulary. And there's lots of different ways that we can do that. So I'm gonna give you a little, I'm gonna stop talking for a minute and give you something to do. So if you can see hopefully lots of terms from school programming education on the screen there. So this is just a basically a Sue mind dump of terms that you might come across in programming. I want you to think about what would be the terms if you were, if you were thinking about either primary or secondary, to pick one of those two and think about which five or 10 terms from that list would you expect students not just to understand, but what terms would you expect them to use confidently in the way that they explain their programs to you. That's different for them being able to recognize those terms. Which of those terms would you expect your learners or learners we are researching or in, in whatever the, the world you're in to be confident to use accurately when they're explaining programs? And there's a lot there. So it kind of shows the tasks that we have when we're dealing with the issue of vocabulary. I'm not going to ask for feedback. I'm going to, you can take that to your breakout group. So in summary, when I'm talking about language, remember that the teacher's role is vital. That comes out of the research. Children need guidance and practice in order to get familiar with talking about programs. If you can talk productively about your programs, that has a positive impact on learning. And we need to use a variety of strategies to teach key terms. So now that's my sort of setting the scene, but what does this have to do with computing and programming? What does this have to do with PRIM? Well, I'm going to tell you. The focus of my talk today is gonna to be on these two questions that I'm gonna come back to at the end. How should we talk to and with learners in programming lessons to improve learning outcomes? And how does the PRIM approach support ways of talking in the classroom? So that takes me on to my second part. So I'm now going to, before I get into PRIM, I'm going to make sure I don't know where you've all come from and, and what your backgrounds are, um, just to make sure they're all on the same page with regards to what are the challenges about learning program. And I've been to lots of online conferences this year and I went to one, um, ITICSI actually in sort of June, July time. And the keynote speaker said, we talk about the challenges of programming every paper or, or there's dozens or hundreds of papers that have been written and they all start with this one line. Learning programming is very challenging. It's, you know, students have great difficulties in learning programming and nobody ever goes any further in thinking about why that, um, why that is particularly. And I want to challenge you if you're a teacher, it could be 
about the way that we actually teach the programming that it makes it so challenging. So think about some of the ways that we may go wrong when we're teaching programming to actually make it challenging. Has anybody ever asked um, students to copy this code? Copy this code in. I've sat at the back of lots of um, um, secondary school lessons uh, where students have um, been, and, and I've been guilty of it myself in my early teaching days, given a piece of, of code to copy in. Um, it takes them a whole lesson, but by the time they've debugged all the errors and tried to work out how the environment was, they don't have any idea what it's supposed to do. They just about get it in and then the lesson is ended. Um, so that you know, may not be helping. We often say, here's a problem, solve this problem, write a program to solve this problem. And you get a big blank Python idle window or a, um, and you don't know where to start, you get frustrated. This is where you would get again um, students um, feeling very frustrated and the teachers say, oh, they need to build resilience. They don't need to build resilience, we just need good teaching strategies. And then this last one is something that's come out of the interviews I've been doing in the last few weeks. A teacher said to me, before Prim, I was going from modeling to make. I was like, um, modeling something here. This is, this is how you do this on the, let me show you me, me programming something. And now off you go, you go and do it. And in the teacher's words, uh, the word that, uh, was, there's a huge chasm between those two things. So we need to think about the, um, the, the way we're teaching. And there are lots of challenges in programming that uh, just exist without us um, messing it up and maybe not teaching um, in the most useful ways. There, is, there are things like there is this you know, perception that programming is hard. There is this thing called um, the geek gene where people genuinely believe that, um, that some children can't learn programming. And because they go into teaching with that belief, it, it has an imp impact on the, what they expect from their students. So this is a huge challenge area. There's the focus on the, the outcome. If your program works, you've got it, that's great, but you may not understand how that program works. And then there's misconceptions. And I think we, there has been a lot of work done around misconceptions, but I don't know whether school teachers, um, uh, we, whether we really highlight that enough in teacher education um, that, so that we can bring that into the classroom and we can, answer, we can think about how we help students with this misconception or that misconception. So there's a lot on that slide. I haven't got time to go through it. I'm going to move on, um, but you can go back over these slides later. So now I'm going to go on to the PRIM approach. Now the PRIM approach has several key principles that I want to talk about before I explain what it is. And these are things that are really implicit in the way that um, PRIM works in, in structuring lessons. So six principles I want to highlight. First of all, we should be, when we've got beginner programmers, we should be reading code before we write code, just in the same way that we learn to read before we learn to write. When we're reading in our natural language, we see um, examples of written language and we, we learn different types of reading before, as we're learning to write or before we learn to write. Second principle, talk about your program. Talk about it with somebody else. That's a key principle behind PRIM. Thirdly, unpacking. Unpack what's in that complex pro program. Um, understand what the program code is all about. Fourthly, Start with a program that exists, that's out there, that you don't, the learner doesn't have an emotional tie to, doesn't have responsibility for, and doesn't feel very upset if it doesn't work. Start with somebody else's program and gradually take ownership of the program when you're ready. And fin final principle is that Prim is around structuring lessons in a way that supports in these ways. And I've already mentioned Vygotsky once, um, but, this, this idea of something being out in the social, in the sort of social space before it, it's, it's brought into the intellectual space, the cognitive domain um, is part of the way that, that um, of, of Vygotsky's writings. And also 
is this idea that we need that we need um, language as a mediating tool to learning, and that's what's underlying Prim. So here's the Prim approach: five different um, stages, not necessarily in one lesson. First of all, here's some code. Predict what it does. Um, you you don't need to trace it. You might have lots of other lots of clues in the program as to what it does. Um, what do you think it does? Make a prediction. Then take that code, run it, test your prediction. Investigate. This is where you can get interesting and vary lots of different activities. What is the action? What does what does the code do? How does it work? What does this line mean? How can we debug it? All this all the little activities you can do around investigate, I'll get to in a moment. Then modify it, change it, try to start to take ownership of it, and then make design and make a new program using what you've learned. And Prim fits into a whole world where there's lots of other programming pedagogy. Prim is just one approach. We already heard earlier in the seminar series about worked examples, about semantic waves, lots of different ways, but Prim is just one part of the teacher's toolkit and it helps teachers structure the lessons, helps to, to helps teachers to, to reflect on how they're teaching and teachers have told me a lot over the last two years that it helps to with differentiation and catering with different learning needs. So I'm now going to give you an exercise to do. So you can't grab a partner, but grab a um, piece of paper and a pen. Have a look at this code. Apologies for anyone who's seen me talk and seen this piece of code before. Um, and uh, even if you don't know any Python, look at this code. Um, Oliver, can you nod if everyone can see this code? Um, yep, yeah, great. Everyone can see this code. And then I want you to draw what the output would be when this code is run. We've got 30 seconds to do that. Now, if I was doing this in a real life classroom or you were doing it with your students, there'd be a buzz around everybody talking about, oh, I can see there's a bit of a clue there in blue. It says square. Um, you know, the, the, what do the numbers mean? Um, what does the 100 and the 90 and the 45 mean? You know, people giving their own opinions about what it does. It's and, and, and actually having a drawn output is quite um, exciting as well. So has everybody got something on their piece of paper? So now I'm going to imagine that I'm going to give you the program. You're going to load it up. You're going to run it. You're going to run it. And then you're going to see. And did you get this as your output? So um, maybe you can. <laughs> I can only see marks, but marks. Um, uh, uh, got it right by the looks of things. And uh, oh yes, I can see Linda's waving hers at me as well. And uh, apologies to those of you who've done this exercise on multiple occasions. Um, but this is the idea of the predict and the run. And here's some other examples. Here's a predict example. Um, again, you don't have to necessarily trace it. You can do some tracing, some guessing. It says a menu, um, it says cooking. Uh, it's got an if statement in there. It's a, you know, it's something around um, some food. Um, and uh, this is one of the exercises that we had in the research trial that we did. Then it's really important that you don't just say to students, now oh, you predicted it, now copy it in. You just get that takes you back to square one. Don't make them copy it in, get it on a shared drive, access it by um, whatever amazing tools we have these days to share bits of code, run it and then test your prediction and see. And then investigate, and this is where you can have lots of fun and you can do lots of different exercises and lots of different um, um, activities. So what happens if you do this when you run the code? What happens if this is your input? What why do you need this line? What about if you deleted that line? Or you can do little matching exercises like here, I've got an activity where I've got A, B, C, D pointing to different things and then you've got to match them to sets of things with um, dis descriptions of different functions. So lots of different activities for investigate. And if you are, hopefully you've all read the latest issue of Hello World. 
Hello World is a great magazine for um, computing educators. If you've not heard of it before, go to helloworld.cc. Sean, who's the editor, is on the call at the moment. And I wrote an article, and I can't go into great detail now, but to show that the variety of different questions can be mapped to the block model so that you can ensure in your investigate phase, you're really asking different questions that have good coverage across what we understand about program comprehension. And your goal is to cover lots of different aspects of the program when you're asking these questions. And you might do that through several less, through several different iterations of teaching. It doesn't have to have to be on each piece of code, but just be aware that when you're uh, for, for different classes, for, for different occasions, you want to be asking different types of questions. And then you get onto the modify and look at the questions here, improve, modify, change. So you've got, you know, you now have to, to do something that just builds on what you've got already to make, um, make something that's a bit more like your own. And you can do this in pairs too. Um, this is all collaborative, lots of talking going on. Whoops. And finally, design and make a new program. And there will be some need to, um, to then be thinking about um, how you plan that your next uh, the program you're going to make the design activities etc. So now I've talked about Prim probably for quite a long time. I'm going to um, uh, very quickly talk about the research now we've done on Prim, so I can get on to the whole point of this session, which is around classroom talk and Prim. So I said at the beginning. We started working on PRIM in 2017. Um, we first of all, um, well, I first of all tried it out with some teachers on some teach, teacher training courses. And then we did a pilot study with a small number of teachers um, when we were very closely involved as researchers, as sort of a, sort of a design-based research activity. And then on the basis of that pilot study, we had a much bigger study in 2018. We had 13 different schools um, involved, 493 um, students on PRIM, 180 in the control group. We did a quasar experimental study and then we followed it up with qualitative research with the teachers. We had um, both groups completing a baseline test to show equivalency. And then we had a post test uh, where we um, compared the two groups. For the teachers, we had different types of schools involved. So we had um, mixed, um, mixed gender schools, girls schools, boys schools, state schools, all through schools, independent schools, uh, male teachers, female teachers. So we had a variety. We had journals to fill in, a focus group, and then in-depth interviews with a researcher. And there was a lot of quality data that we've used since then. The, I'm just gonna show the quantitative research um, results here which showed that the experimental group did better than the control group in the post-test. The post-test was more difficult than the baseline, which was for programming novices. And so we showed from that, that we thought that PRIM had made an impact on learning outcomes. But actually, we, we, since then we want to find out why that is the case. So to investigate a little bit more about how PRIM works. So I'm going to move on to the, um, the next um, section of my talk, which is really focusing on language. Just to um, share another output we've had about PRIM recently, which is at this link, um, a two page um, quick read on PRIM. And this image is taken from there. There are four different parts of, of PRIM. If you think about it from a teacher's point of view, you structure your lessons. There's the language and the talking part. There's the content of the questions I've talked about in Investigate. And then this is the idea of having a shared artifact that it's gradually um, the learner takes ownership of. So I'm just gonna focus now on the language part of PRIM. So when we did our study, I just said we had lots of qualitative research, um, qualitative um, data from the teachers. And they, they did give us lots of feedback around um, the, um, I've skipped a slide, I'll skip that bit. They gave us lots of feedback around um, the, the talking that happened in the classroom. 
So here we've got a little bit about they were talking and bouncing ideas off each other and that made it enjoyable and different. There was more active talking and planned talking about the programming because of the way the questions are worded. Well, that was just the resource materials. Teachers can create their own materials, but the idea is it's planned so that there are opportunities to talk in depth about the program. And then we've got a teacher who said, some girls who weren't so confident became more confident because there were structured things that they could talk about and they could talk about those things in pairs. So this was all very good. Um, in our research, I'm going to, if you just bear with me, I'm going to go back to the slide that I just skipped over. Go back, 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 back. And I think that prim and language is something about these things here. It's the having the vocabulary to use to articulate the understanding. So talking about those programs means you need the, 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 the you, you need the terms that you need to use to explain it actually saying it out loud like we know about the thing you can talk to rubber duck and articulate your how your program works talk to a human being that's a good idea and then through we can have the questioning element is also in there and then you've got the teacher facilitating of course that's the key part of sort of social cultural theory about the teacher being the most knowledge knowledgeable other the and you know encouraging this talk so that's why i think that prim is really encouraging class and talk. So I'll skip forward again, never get your slides in order. So now I'm just starting a new study. And this study um, is focusing partly on um, how teachers have been using PRIM in the last two years since we sort of last did a study. So a sort of two years on study, but also focusing on language in particular. So these research questions, in what way does talk support the improvement of, of programming skills and how can teachers facilitate dialogue? So I've just carried out 19 interviews with teachers. And um, so I'm gonna talk about those very, very early themes in a moment. And then um, the next phase, which will take place over the winter months is some talk diaries um, with, with some teachers looking at how talk happens in classroom. And then eventually stage three will be going into the classroom to do observations and recordings, but this won't actually be able to happen until next academic year because of this thing called a pandemic, because of the COVID um, restrictions, it's, um, you know, we're prohibited from doing that. So from this, I want to just highlight some early themes that's coming out of the, the so these are, I'm going to show you some comments that the, the teachers um, that have been using PRIM for the last year or two are um, coming up with to reflect on how PRIM impacts them in terms of, of, of the language in the classroom. So one teacher has said to me in, from a secondary school, students are finding a language, we try and give them a language. If you read this quote, something difficult to understand, parameters and return values. So being able to um, give students the words to use means that they have um, the means to express themselves better, better meta model about what it is, and that's through this very careful discussion that we have about the programs and how they work. So that's one theme that's been coming out. Second theme is around students are discussing um, how things work, how to get things work, more peer conversation and that that discussion is more productive if you think about what we talked about right at the beginning about needing to have um, conversation that's productive third theme teachers are modeling programming terms most of the teachers that i spoke to are saying they're thinking about um, that they're using the opportunity of the predict and the investigate phase to share those terms and model the correct vocabulary. And teachers do this in different ways. Some people do it, some teachers do it through um, very um, explicit modeling and, and teaching of vocabulary. Others take the opportunity to bring in the vocabulary during the exercises. So you introduce the vocabulary and then you let the students use it. And finally, and there was diff 
different um, opinions in this. Some teachers said they were talking less, but um, and some teachers said they were talking more because they were highlighting the the, the vocabulary. Um, but other but across the board, there was this theme around talking at a more high level, a more advanced level about the code um, and, and about the content of the program and why it worked and how it worked. And this was really interesting. So the initial findings really were around um, teachers saying that they thought Pro Prim was developing a language for them to talk coherently, using this predict and investigate phase, using different strategies to introduce vocabulary, and then using the Prim structure in general to facilitate it and encouraging a common language. So these the things I started at the beginning, dialogue and vocabulary are coming through. So I don't know if you remember, if you were, if you remember back to right at the beginning when I talked about the classroom dialogue pro project that Cambridge did, um, one of the pieces of research, I talked about the fact that they said um, with those young students, um, they needed to see elaboration, querying and student participation in those dialogues for them to have an impact on um, uh, learning outcomes. So I was looking for those things in the teacher's comments. And I think I found some examples. So elaboration. So it, the, there'll be somebody saying, um, I know what this does. And another, another student saying, I know what that does. And they're bringing those ideas together. It's really um, sort of elaborating on each other's comments. And that also comes under the sort of participation heading. And then querying. So where does that come from? Having that conversation about why is it doing that, that kind of querying going on. And then the participation, the students discussing things together. They can actually, the, 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 the quote says, they can actually have, oh, I've tried this, have a look at that. That kind of participating with each other around the, um, the way they're structuring their programs. So it's really lovely to see those comments coming through. So I'm coming to my conclusion. Oliver hasn't waved at me yet, so I think I'm not out of time. Um, so I'm coming towards my conclusion to the two questions that I, I highlighted at the beginning. How should we talk to and with learners in programming lessons to improve learning outcomes? So, so far in this research that I've done with teachers, the messages that I'm getting from the teachers who've been using Prem successfully is that, that we should be encouraging students to explain how a program works, modeling use of programming construct vocabulary and creating this shared language and using not just, but particularly the predict and investigate stages to talk about the program, use dialogue and key vocabulary to help the confidence in the, the, lang the, the um, understanding of how the program works. How does the PRIM approach do this? I think the focus on investigating helps with this articulating. I think the emphasis on the pair work and the group work means that students have an opportunity for dialogue and that having the, the, the dialogue helps with the vocabulary. And just a word here about the situation we're in. We're in a global, you know, we're, we're in a situation where some students are learning remotely. And if you're in class and if you're a teacher on this, uh, um, on listening to this seminar, you may well be at the front. Students are socially distanced. This is really difficult. So in the breakout groups, I'd hope for, that you could be able to think about how can we do prim in this sort of current, current situation. It's really challenging at the moment. So now I'm going to get to my final part is what I'm planning next. So continuing this work around language, you need to, my, my goals, I'm hopefully still working with Jane and Maria to look at um, how we can encourage productive talk in the classroom and to maybe get a taxonomy of different types of talk to support teachers and to inform work around language in computing and language in programming. And I think generally we need more research in this area. In general, 
I want to continue the work around the block model that I talked about earlier around questioning. What has arisen is this idea about the, the jump between modify and make. And I think I never really um, in, intended to miss out design. Um, I just think that PRIMDOM and the, the, the acronym didn't really work. Um, but I think maybe uh, making more explicit that make involves planning and design. Um, Jane and I are talking about whether it's prim a semantic wave to bring those two things together. I think the jury's out on whether prim is a semantic wave. And some of those are some of the things that I'm thinking about in taking the prim work further forward. So in summary today, um, and I'm gonna let, let you go and discuss this in your groups. Hopefully I've talked a little bit about the background of language, why programming is difficult, principles of prim and, the, and, and why I think language and um, programming, you know, uh, uh, um, language in programming classes is so important. There's some further reading there. The website is there that um, slightly neglected website, um, priming.wordpress.com, but it does have the resources that we use for both research studies. You're very welcome to go and use those, adapt them, do what you'd like with those. And then I'm coming to the end of my talk and I know from being a chair that it's quite helpful if, um, if the speaker gives some questions for breakout groups. So I've got some suggested questions there. So depending on whether you're, if you're a teacher, you might be thinking about how this relates to your practice and in a pandemic. If you're a researcher, I want to ask you why, why we're not doing anything about language and computing as, as a topic of research. If you've never heard of PRIM before, what do you think about it generally? Um, think about what, what, what's resonated with you. And if maybe you've come from a different sec a different phase and you're new to K-12 or school education and, and you're not really aware of some of these issues, what's the difference that we have in school and how does that relate to your own experience? So Oliver, hopefully that's enough questions for um, everyone to be getting on with. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Sue. You've taken us through so much there, the, the background, the developments, uh, taken us through our own mini prim lesson and, um, and the research and what you found. Thanks. It's really, really fascinating. Um, so, yeah, we're going to move into the breakout groups in just a second. You'll be uh, sent into some small groups um, for about 20 minutes and um, it's a chance to discuss with people and uh, then we'll come back and we can present questions to, to Sue and uh, dig into the topic uh, even more. We were just get I don't know if anyone else was in this position, but we were just getting into a really in-depth discussion of, um, of one particular point and somebody had to explain for last 30 seconds. Can you get your point down in 30 seconds? <laughs> but we've got a little bit longer now to um, to discuss and uh, as, as a larger group. So um, yeah, we, we've got until half past um, the hour to, to, to talk things through. If you have uh, questions, please post them into the chat and I'll, um, I'll pick some people and we can, um, you could, I can just ask you a question in text if you want, or you can, you can come on and, and ask Sue the question, get the discussion going directly. Just while people are doing that, while they're posting them, we had a discussion in our group and I'm sure it came up in a lot of groups about the current sort of distance learning uh, situation. And um, Sue, we wondered what thoughts you had on uh, what are the key things to, to do to be able to take this kind of prim approach if you're working in a, a distance learning situation where you've got students not physically present? Um, well, all I can say is what I've been told by teachers that, you know, having to do, you know, having to do online programming lessons. And um, I've heard about teachers using um, Replit and tools like that to be able to share code and then get students to predict and you know just carrying out the exercises but sending them remotely. So as I think that going through the structure of those things is 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 still possible over sort of doing remote lessons. But I think what you have to be a bit more creative about is the thing that I'm more passionate about is the talking to each other. I mean setting the this is the predict exercise. This is the you know that now you run it. So I think. Um, some of the teachers I spoke to put their students in groups on teams or whatever to talk about pro, you know, to talk about a program and how to sort of manipulate. I think it's how much you sort of privilege the, uh, or 
you know how much you really value the the, the sort of collaboration and the, the talking articulating element of the you know understand getting to getting to know this program and how it works so i think it's all possible um but you could do th but my my quick answer my, not very long answer sorry um would be that yes possible but make sure you keep the talking in there in some way yeah yeah that's so um and just to sort of follow up on that when you say talking um do you mean very much um verbally talking because in these distance learning environments there may be you know the text-based chat and things like that do you have any thoughts on sh should people really be aiming for that verbal uh, discussion rather than relying on text is there a balance how what do you think i think that's really interesting because um i have um Lots of teachers do code annotation exercises. So rather than talk about the code, they will write down next to the code what it does. And I think that's very valuable, but in a way it's it's giving the student another barrier be because once it's written, it's sort of like there. So it's it's the, 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 the verbal language is the rehearsal of that. Do you know what I mean? So rehearsing what you're 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 trying to say before you have to then commit those words to paper when you're annotating that code. So I think you know if that's all you have, if you only have the written medium or the you know the the, 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 the to be able to do that, then it's all communication is valuable. Do you know what I mean? And, and and it's all but but if you can, if it's possible to have. You know, some verbal you know, sort of oracy, the sort of thing. You know, in, enables you to rehearse what you need to then write down. Mm, that's really interesting. I was thinking about that in terms of younger children as well. I think a lot of younger children might really struggle to write some of to to articulate some of their understanding, even if their understanding of the program is quite good. Um, writing it down is is another thing, isn't it? Um, Haley's posted a, a question and we had a discussion in our group as well about the importance of language and communication skills. I guess that kind of builds on that really. Um, whether perhaps we should be thinking more about those skills and less about the skills that are often put in as prerequisites for further study and computing that are the math skills. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Is, is communication skills perhaps more important than than mathematics skills as a as a prerequisite if you're going into further study. All skills are important. <laughs> That's the cop out answer. But yeah. the um, there was this there was this, this research probably everybody's familiar with it that came out at the beginning of this year, um, saying that you know being good at language learning was as much of a um, sort of a precursor for learning programming as mathematical ability. Um, I don't know if anyone came across that work, which is really interesting because, um, I mean, my background was from linguistics and AI, natural language processing. That's why I've got a thing about language. Mm. Um, so um, I think it's not, I'm not really answering your questions, but I did want to say there is that kind of parallel of understanding language being very helpful when you're learning a programming language. But I mean, the question around language and communication skills, language and communication skills are interest are important for anything you want to do. You know, I mean, they are important. They're really important for computing. Um, but that when you said it instead of Haley's question says it more important than maths or computer science, of course, that depends on what you're doing in computer science, computer science, people sort of is, is, a, is a really broad area. So there's some areas where mathematical um, understanding is absolutely crucial and in and other areas where you know sort of more linguistic understanding is crucial and in programming I think you need a bit of both. Mm. That's, that's really interesting thanks we've got another question that's come up um, twice that's another one I think is really interesting is about the vocabulary um, sort of subject specific vocabulary and computing but um, is maybe different from how it's used in natural language. Um, you know, words that have different um, meanings in computing, like arguments or variables. Um, so students might be familiar with their 
natural language version and then they're using them in, in computing is that something that's that's come up in the research at all have any of the the uh, teachers commented on how students engage with uh, with that kind of language through this approach um i'm got i've got muddled up which which question are you asking the questions that where things have different meanings in the real world yeah yeah so um the chapter in um the era and juliana wrote called language and computing it's only a short chapter but that deals with that quite well because it talks about having a meta discourse with your students so that you you know the word argument comes up so you know yeah i mean all and all the world words in databases field and record and all those things Every, you know there's so many words in computing that have different different meanings and so it's about being very upfront about that and saying this is um you know this this word means this in this context and this in this context and this is where we're talking about it is a scientific language and, and having that discussion about the naming of things but what i think is um more difficult is when you start you're trying to um if you're trying to unpack what you're teaching i'm doing a semantic wave with my hand if you're trying to unpack what you're teaching by making it simple and making the language simple you can inadvertently then confuse your students because you're then using language that doesn't actually mean the same thing scientifically. So um, an example might be, you know, telling your computing what to do. The teacher might say, if you tell the computer, whatever, when they're talking about programming, you're not telling verbally telling the computer anything, but you're trying to explain something about write what you're actually saying is, you know, write an instruction that the computer execute, you know, that, that the computer can execute, and you end up saying, tell the computer. And, and so that's where I think we need to be really careful about what we're saying, because you know, listen it. That's what I hope to do with these talk diaries in the next phase of my research, is you know, listening out for the language that you're using that could actually be muddling up concepts and confusing students. Does that answer the question at all? Yes, yeah, I think so. It's about, about being really careful with the, the context. Um, yeah, if that very much reminds me of when, um, when I first started teaching maths and science to primary students and thinking about all just being really careful to be really precise about language in different contexts all the time. It's, it is so important. Um, it's easy for, to forget how much that could confuse people, I think. Um, we've got another question um, on sort of a bit of a different tangent, but are there any tips for effective student engagement in the predict stage? Uh, the group who discussed this found that um, in practice, pupils often want to skip through that stage. Perhaps they want to get more onto onto the more practical side of things. Um, how do you make that engaging, that predict stage? Um, yeah, I mean, actually, I don't, I, I haven't had many teachers say that it, that's the stage that's not engaging, but lots of teachers have said they bring in a kind of competitive element to, to it a little bit, like, you know, which group is going to be able to work out what this does first and that, and that sort of thing. Um, I think if you're and make the make the little bit of starter code more interesting replace your variable names with things like tomato and elephant just to, to make it you know a little bit more challenging um you know just mix it up i think just just to make it more fun um so and just don't let them anywhere near the code until they until they've um had a go be really disciplined about that, I guess, not skipping forward. You know, I think if it's just, um, it's if, again, it's quite difficult if you're remote because you're just going to pick up the thing, you're going to run it and see what it would do. But what you're trying to do is trying to think before I run this, what do I think that it might do? Mm. Um, so it's actually engaging with it rather than, you know, you know, rather than just running it to see what it would do. Yeah, it's that kind of pause for reflection that often goes at the end of lessons, I think, doesn't it? It's bringing it in quite early and getting students ready to do that, yeah. Um, 
Does anyone want to ask me a question in person? Because yes, that's what I was thinking. Is there anyone <laughs> who wants to come through and uh, and ask that? That's a question in person. We've got. I've I've been I've been, got a, a question privately from uh, Stanley um, about block based programming. Stanley, do you want to turn your microphone on and ask see that one? Oh yes. Um, Thanks. Right, go ahead. Right. Recently, I did the course on programming for primary schools. Really, just to, to start over in terms of learning programming because I started learning assembly language when I did my program, and I found that the block-based programming was, um, you know, an easier introduction to programming there. The transition from a flow diagram that was useful in starting a program to now this block type programming, and then that there's a translation to the text based programming. So, you know, it gives you a, a smoother transition there. So, in terms of your, your experience, how useful has that been in assisting the learning of programming? That's really the question. Yes, so um, lots of the, I mean, most of our primary teachers use block-based programming, and then some in early in the um, um, in 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 the in England um, in our curriculum, and um, sometimes early in Key Stage Three as well. I don't know if, um, but and some we've got lots of prim resources been made for primary. Jane, who did this research with me, who could wave. Um, Jane is a primary teacher, so she's an expert on block. So, so we find that Prim works just as well for Scratch and block-based programming as for um, you know, Python and text-based. I mean, initially, the initial research we did was with um, secondary school students and in text-based programming, but actually I would say it's the pro primary teachers who've run with it, probably for help by Jane's um, CPD sessions. Um, who've really run with Prim and been using it um, with with um, Scratch and other block-based programming environments. And there were lots of um, materials done by Phil Bag at Codit, what's his website, codit.co.uk, that you can access for free that use Prim and other pedagogies for teaching Scratch, um, programming through Scratch. So yeah, lots of that, yeah. Okay, thank you. That's great. Yeah, we were talking in, in our group about that, and I was just imagining how good this could be working with uh, with younger children with Scratch. Um, there was a comment about uh, we've talked a bit about maths in terms of maths content, but I think Stu Susan had a slightly different take on it. Um, Susan, do you want to to come on and and, and put, make your point or, or ask your question? Um. It was really about pedagogy. I think that we, we get a bit obsessed about skills and content and it, it um, I think we have to look at pedagogy and, and there are certain principles in um, like what you're talking about is, is about group work and encouraging discussion and that goes across all subjects but it looks different in different subjects. Mm learn from it and I, I so so when we talked about the maths it sort of felt like we were what's taught but not the pedagogy and all I mean I was on a big group work project some years ago in Cambridge and um, we were comparing maths science and English and there were common things but actually they felt very different but but when we got all our teachers together at the end there were more similarities than differences, which surprised them. Um, and working with primary school teachers, in our group we talked about how do primary school teachers teach computer studies, and that primary school teachers feel maths is a different play pedagogy. And I think um, my colleague uh, Tugba uh, was saying the same thing about trying to get primary school teachers to teach computer studies, they feel it's a different subject, not very skilled in maths. And so they're quite surprised when you say that, that 
that, that the skills they've got as teachers can be used for teaching the things that they don't feel skilled in. So I think we have to talk about pedagogy much more than about the what. We have to talk about the how and the why. Um, and I don't think that's, we're not very, very good at that. So I, I also sort of said that maybe we should look at modern foreign language pedagogy. Not that I think it's particularly good, but it, but it might be an interesting one to look at. It might be better for girls as well, if given we've got all this problem with girls taking computer studies. Why do, why do, they, why do they not take computer studies, but they do take French? Mm. Yeah. And in, well, that's um, um, in the National Centre for Computing Education, which, which we're working on in England, we have done a lot of work on pedagogy. There was a link to the pedagogy outputs. You know, Prim is just one bit of pedagogy that we've been um, looking at to try and support teachers on this. And in terms of girls, um, we have a gender balance project, Catherine, who could wave. Is, and Emma, who could wave, well, she can't wave because she's not uh, working on the gender balance project, looking at um, pair programming and peer instruction and 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 pedagogies are, are, that, that support um, the way girls might be more engaged with computing. So we're trying to work on that thing because I think you're right. In the, if you look back at the history of introducing computing into England, so 2010 when the original GCC computer science was piloted and then 2014 we had the new curriculum, we were all completely focused on helping teachers develop their subject knowledge in a subject that was new to them. And then about three or four years later on, all that we heard, I wasn't teaching then, I was in teacher education, was now we know the stuff, we need to know how to teach it. You know, tell us how, what, and that's why I think in a way, Prim has been really taken up, but the reason it was really successful was because it landed in a void two years ago. Nobody in computing was, James put a thumbs up. Nobody in computing was thinking about, you know, they weren't really coming up with anything to support classroom practice in terms of pedagogy. So people saw Prim and went, oh yeah, this, you know, we'll try this and we need more, work like that and I should say there are lots of teachers who've tried have got variations of prim people that are like there's k pride which starts with keywords there's epic which I can't remember what epic is but it's something and there's time which is Craig and Dave's one and there's you know they're all variations they're all the same thing it doesn't matter what the, the initials say it's t it's it's being able to think reflectively about the way you you, the way you run a programming lesson that what kind of things you do before other things and you know how you share that with students but the the specific thing for programming is that um is slightly different for other subjects that you know the the, the, the um I'm, I'm i'll just put a full stop on my last point so yes yeah, so yes we need to think about pedagogy but um there is something particular about programming that um i think that the, the the research that's been done in it the misconceptions around programming we need to we need to focus on the pedagogy for teaching programming particularly um with a sort of a laser focus on that particularly i think but i think yeah i agree with your point about pedagogy it's a great point to, to end on as well as I've talked a lot about giving students the language you're sort of talking about giving teachers the language to discuss um, the pedagogy and a structure to kind of keep moving that forward which is really exciting um we're gonna have to draw things to a close um there i've got a few more things to just just share with you before you go but um first of all um, just say a great big thank you to, to Sue. That's been a really fascinating uh, discussion. Um, yeah, thanks so much for, sh for sharing um, all of your insights and your research that you've done and also what you're going to be working on next. It's really, really great. Um, so thank, thank you, Sue. Thank you, everyone else, for, for joining us. Um, we have um, 
some some more seminars coming up so um, i'm just i'm going to tell you a, a little bit more um about that we we have um another one in this series next time from uh, david Weintrop from the university of maryland who's going to be speaking about uh, the role of block-based programming in computer science education um so that's our next seminar and the information um about that is on the on the website which is at the, the top of the slides there um but we also have um, an exciting new series coming up um, in the new year. Um, so we've got a number of, um, of seminars coming up uh, there, starting off looking at computing education for underrepresented groups um, and that kind of topic with uh, Peter Kemp from King's College and Billy Wong from University of Reading. Um, then we're following um, that up looking at equity folks pardon me, equity focused teaching um, in K-12 to uh, CS um, and we've got colleagues from the University of, of Texas at Austin, University of Redlands and Bellevue School District um, looking at that and also then followed on from that with supporting computational algorithmic thinking in the context of intersectional computing um, and there's, there's really, you know, a strong theme here, as you can see, around diversity and opening up computing to or the opportunities of computing to all groups um, and everyone who deserves to, to benefit from them. So we really hope that you can you can join us for for the, the next one, um, which is uh, which is coming up and uh, then that series as well. Sue, I don't know, is there anything you wanted to add about the, the new series? No, I just can say I'm. I just we're really excited. We've we've had quite a lot of programming, and uh, for this year, we this is our this is our tenth seminar. By the time we get to 2020, we're up to our eleventh seminar. We're hoping to publish a little book about our seminar series, and then we launch in 2021 with hope with three months on diver three seminars on diversity, hopefully followed by three seminars on inclusion, so that we we um we we you know we really thought it'd be really good to focus on that as our sort of spring theme mm. so um i'm delighted that um we've got you know peter billy tia's bringing on nicole and shamari and jaquita are coming to talk to us all about those things so hopefully you'll all come along yeah please do Tuesdays, five o'clock or whatever time it is for you beginning of the month yeah um, and so hopefully you're all signed up to the emails that will let you know about that if you're not sure if you are you can have a look at that site there rpf.io forward slash research hyphen seminars oh. and you'll be able to sign up we've just realized there's a mistake on the slide it should say 5th of january 2nd of february and something in march ah uh, oh yes 3rd of november is today it's also the 2nd of march second right of okay I think she'd, be, she'd be a bit horrified if she was talking today <laughs> yeah so we won't preempt that one too soon well thank you very much everyone thank for you. coming Please do carry on the conversation on um, the hashtag. Um, we've been sharing things on hash RPF seminars. Um, so you can uh, you can join in the conversation on that. You can get in touch with Sue directly um, there. And we also have a research update um, email that's, that comes out every, every month or so um, sharing research activities we're involved with at Raspberry Pi, interesting things we've been reading, events that are coming up, um, and just uh, sharing lots of things about computing education research. Um, we'll also be sharing the video um, from tonight or this afternoon or whatever time it is for you. We'll be sharing that on the webpage uh, really shortly. Um, so um, yeah, that, that will be there. If you spoke during the Q&A section, but you don't want to be included in the video, please could you just drop us an email to uh, let us know and we'll happily um, make that edit for you. Uh, but if you're happy to be included, then um, that video will be will be included soon. So thank you very much for, for joining us. Thanks again to Sue and, uh, and everyone for your questions and hopefully see you all next time.